This is episode 20 of Entrepreneurs for a Change. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to our mailing list at entrepreneursforachange.com. Are you ready to be the change? If so, you've come to the right place. You are about to join a movement of entrepreneurs who are empowering people, saving the planet, and turning their passion into profits while creating the lifestyle of their dreams. If you don't believe us, check out our website at entrepreneursforachange.com, a place where you can be inspired, mentored, and supported by a tribe of change-making entrepreneurs just like you. Hello, beautiful change makers. This is Lorna Lee, the host of yet another episode of Entrepreneurs for a Change, a web show about entrepreneurs who are changing business as usual by creating passion-fueled businesses that make a positive impact, express their life purpose, and support their lifestyles. Today, we're going to talk about a taboo subject in the world of business, depression. It's taboo because in the business world, you are not allowed to be depressed, let alone show it. If you even talk about being sad or bummed out, people kind of give you a funny look, back away slowly, avoid you, or in the very least might give you a pat on the back and say, buck up champ, turn the page, you'll get through this, tomorrow's a new day. Which, while being well-meaning, may not necessarily do much to actually improve your mood. In business, you're supposed to be a go-getter, a mind hacker, and those who exude optimism and charisma attract success and followers. But what do you do when life happens? If you experience a death in the family, or a devastating divorce or breakup? What if your company has gone down in flames? How do you keep on going when the last thing you feel like doing is getting out of bed? What if you have everything great going for you, so much to be grateful for, yet you just can't explain why you feel kind of down, like a dark cloud follows you everywhere you go? It's not like you're a suicidal or need treatment, simply that deep down inside, you know you could accomplish so much more and enjoy life more fully if you just felt better about yourself. Depression is particularly deadly to the self-employed because all of your business is self-generated. If you don't work, you don't earn money. So our guest today, TJ Nelson, founder of the site Dominate Depression, will share with us his strategies on how you can beat back depression and optimize your mood naturally. TJ is a lifestyle entrepreneur who is able to heal himself of depression and wean himself off of antidepressants without medication. He now helps other people beat back depression and reclaim their mental and emotional well-being. Even if you're not depressed, his wisdom on how you can optimize your mood naturally is priceless. He'll share with us the different types of depression and the nutritional deficiencies that contribute to these mood disorders. How antidepressants work and why you should only use them as a last resort. The one easiest action you can take to know exactly what your body needs in order to maintain optimal mood and energy. Two supplements that can give you a quick, powerful pick-me-up during times of situational depression so you can keep going on with your life. Foods that can negatively impact your mood. Key lifestyle changes that will drastically boost your mental well-being. And much, much more. Show notes can be found on entrepreneursforachange.com slash 20. Now, before diving into the interview, I want to encourage you to rate, review, and download Entrepreneurs for a Change on iTunes. This really helps us reach more people with inspiring stories of entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Also, if these stories inspire you to start a world-changing business of your own, head over to our website at entrepreneursforachange.com and download the Business Changemakers Toolkit to get a jump start today. Now, on to the show. TJ, I'm so glad to have you on my show to talk about a taboo subject in the world of entrepreneurship, depression. I mean, in the business world, if we even talk about our state of mind, we focus on things like mind hacking, body hacking, get shit done, or millionaire mindset. But nobody ever talks about what to do if life happens, if tragedy strikes, and if we fall into a deep funk. It's kind of like we have to power through it, put on a mask, smile, and act positive because in the world of business, you can't appear weak or vulnerable and share your true feelings because nobody will respect you or give you the time of day. But depression, 
I think is deadly for entrepreneurs because unlike employees, we actually have to self-generate our business and our opportunities. We can't just show up and clock time on somebody else's dime. If we don't work, we don't get paid. So let's get started with your story. Who are you? What do you do? And how did you get to where you are now? So I'm TJ Nelson. I just started my site, DominateDepression.com, to help people overcome depression without medication. Basically, how this came about was trying to be an entrepreneur, trying to start a business, and I came back home from the Philippines broke. And I started selling cars. I did really good, but after a while, I was like, you know, selling cars is great, but is this what I want to do is, is sell cars. And so while I was selling the cars, I was like, you know what? I suffered from depression for such a long time, you know, maybe I can work a business out of this. And so I just bought a one-way ticket, told my manager one day I was leaving to Thailand, and flew over here to work on Dominate Depression. So you've been struggling with depression for quite some time then. It seems like the last job that you were in was selling cars, but your history with depression spans longer than this last episode. I mean, it wasn't the selling cars that got you depressed. (laughs) No, no, but I mean, the intro is funny where you say you have to hide it because especially selling cars, if you feel down, like people don't want to buy a car from you if you're depressed. I know. Like, you know, you can't be the depressed car salesman. (laughs) You're not going to sell anything, right? You can't sell cars when you're depressed. (laughs) Okay, so tell me about your history with depression. Then when did you realize it was a problem and that you had to do something about it? Okay, so... I first remember being depressed in fourth grade, so very young. I started, you know, thinking kind of suicidal thoughts, which isn't normal for a kid, right? Not normal for a kid at all. My gosh, that's terrible. I'm sorry. Yeah, and so throughout junior high and high school, I just kind of thought, you know, I got these problems or maybe I'm just in my teens or this is how it's supposed to be or there's just something wrong with me as like a person or my character. But then as things started to progress, I was like, you know, nothing really feels pleasurable. But still so many people told me it's all in your head. It's, you know, you got to just think positive. You just think and you'll know the secret. You'll get what you want in life. So I was sitting there trying to cognitively improve my situation and so the whole time I was like well I don't feel right but everyone's telling me it's all my thoughts so I'm going a little bit crazy and then when I was in high school I went skydiving and that's when I realized depression how real it was because I was like sad so I was like oh maybe it's my lifestyle so I had like a bullet bike riding around really fast and I'm like I'm going to be certified skydiver and I'll always be happy right jumping out of a plane it's, it's hard not to feel the rush. But I got on the plane. We go up into the sky. I'm sitting there with the guy hooked on back with me. Jump out of the plane. And when I land, you know, everyone rushes up and is like, how was it? And I was just like, oh, whatever. It didn't even <laughs> feel good. And I mean, it's kind of sad even talking about that now. But that's when on the ride home, I was like, I just went skydiving. And it still didn't feel good. So there's probably something wrong so everyone's you know jumping out of the plane and you know getting to the ground like woohoo oh my god that was the best rush and you were like nah yeah i was just like oh whatever like it didn't even feel that crazy to me wow okay so you know in terms of like tracing the origins of your depression how much of it do you think has to do with your you know biological makeup and how much of it do you think had to do with your upbringing or your experience during your formative years So that's always been a tricky one for me to figure out. There has been some depression in my parents, but it's hard for me to say, you know, did I inherit the genetic part of the depression or did I see them being depressed? I know in fourth grade, my childhood was actually really good. So I know when my depression first started, it had to have been something else going on in me. And then as the years progressed, I had really rough things happened to me, which just kind of compounded it all together. So I think in my situation, it's kind of a combination of physical things going on and 
there was a lot of events that happened to me that were extremely stressful and so having the being prone to the depression and then having these events happen to me I think over time just built up wore me out you know I probably burned out every neurotransmitter in my brain my adrenals were probably shot so for me personally I can't say it's genetic or it's from my life situation but how I fixed it was going after the physical things that I could do, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. You know, I too can share that I have definitely grappled with depression myself. I think largely a lot of it was situational. It was a combination of, I think, upbringing, but also situational. I think what really compounded it for me was my experience growing up in Hong Kong, which was a British colony. And my parents, you know, were very well-meaning. They placed me in the British school because they had heard that the American school had a lot of drug problems. They're like, oh, you know, she's going to do much better than the British school. And, you know, unfortunately, the British school was just an awful experience for me because I was Chinese and I was American. So the white kids there were really mean to me. And I, you know, couldn't understand why they would refer to me as by racial slurs when I never did anything to them before I didn't even know them and it was this you know environment of being harassed day in and day out for me that kind of caused me to really internalize a lot of feelings of you know low self-esteem low self-worth you know self-hatred even and that was really hard to shake for me over the years because it happened during a formative time in my life and so when those patterns kind of Uh, got ingrained in my mind, it takes a lot of rewiring Mm -hmm. of, you know, your thought patterns to really think differently about yourself. In my exploring everything from Tibetan Buddhist meditation to, you know, up until recently, neuro-linguistic programming, I've also explored the physical or the biological relationships between your state of mind, your health, and overall, like, you know, how you're taking care of your body. So can I ask you, in these years of exploring the topic of depression, what have you discovered about depression? Are there different kinds of depression? Like, for me, when I look at the different types of depression that I've experienced, it ranges from brain fog, low energy, cloud, to that follows me around, to, like, being cranky and, you know, pessimistic to just, you know, downright despair and not wanting to get out of bed. You know, it seems like all of these are different states of mind that actually can be addressed by different things Mm -hmm. uh, or different solutions. So I'm curious to know, like, what you've discovered in your study of the different states of mind and how to address each one. Okay, so what I'm doing with this site is, so with your situation, you had the kids harassing you and those things that you internalized it so you had to do a lot of the cognitive reframing and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, that's been very much a part of my journey. But as well, you know, looking at optimal health and nutrition, looking at supplements, you know. Yes, so there is the depression that can come from like losing a loved one or situations like yours. And then with what I'm specifically doing with the different types of depression is for you know, let's say your life isn't that bad and you're still depressed, then that's when I start going after more of like, let's see what's going on chemically and biologically. So in that sense, looking at depression, you can have someone who says they're depressed. Is, it's kind of like when we say I'm depressed, what do we really mean? I know. It's such a broad <laughs> umbrella term, right? It could <laughs> yeah. range everything from just feeling blah to like feeling suicidal and you actually really need to get help, right? Yes. So it's kind of this weird term that's like thrown around like someone loses their job or they have a bad event happen and they say they're depressed. And it kind of dilutes the word. But depression, how I like to say, is if you can't feel pleasure, basically if you can't enjoy a sunset. And so there's two main types of depression that I've seen. And the first one is typically when someone has low serotonin. So that often results in low self-esteem. They're really obsessive. A lot of like inner hatred or inner tension, shyness. Basically, they hate themselves, and it feels like 
things will never improve. And then there's the second kind, which is typically low in catecholamines, which is dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And with that type of depression, that's when someone wakes up in the morning and they literally can't get out of bed. They don't want to move. They have no energy, but it's not so much like they feel like the world's going to end, but nothing is exciting, nothing's motivating, and they have no drive. Everything's numb. It's just gray. There's no black and white. It's just gray. And so when I was learning about depression, it was just kind of there's so many different causes. There's so many different reasons that you might not feel 100%. And so often we want to say, you know, just take this antidepressant pill, just take this or do this, and it'll fix everything, when in fact you kind of have to look at the whole picture with depression. It's not always here, you know, I wish I could have one supplement that I could just say, here, take this, and you won't be depressed. But, like, it's best to see, am I having anxiety, or what exactly am I feeling? Because with the different types of depression, like low serotonin, you can take supplements like 5-HTP, L-tryptophan, low catecholamines, you can take supplements like L-tyrosine, phenylalanine, and then there's also, you know, you can test your vitamin D levels to see if you're deficient in vitamin D. And then for me personally, I used to have a lot of anxiety, and I started taking magnesium at night, and I started sleeping way better. My anxiety was reduced a ton. And I went and got a blood test, and it also showed I was low in magnesium. So there's so many different things going on that can affect an individual. So it's really important to, with depression, and how I understand it now, is to really just, like, what am I feeling? What are my symptoms? And then, you know, what's my nutrition like? How am I sleeping? My thoughts and everything. So in your journey to dominate depression and overcome this, you know, mood disorder, which basically, you know, can suck so much vitality and joy out of your life, what are the keys to successfully maintaining optimal mood? Maintaining? Yeah. Okay. Maintain, like, you know, so you've overcome depression, mm -hmm. it seems like, and now you're helping other people through your membership site to overcome depression as well. And, you know, what are the different or the key critical components to getting yourself out of depression and maintaining an optimal mood, whatever optimal mm -hmm. might be for you or an individual? For me, I pretty much had to accept that I have to take better care of myself than other people, which in the long run is probably a good thing because I want to be healthier. But for me, I can't eat sugar. Like, I have some glucose problems where if I eat sugar or any, like, simple starches, my moods go out of whack. I have to avoid bread and milk because I did a two-week food allergy test, and after I, you know, eliminated those foods for two weeks and then reintroduced them in and ate them, I bloated up and got tired. So my nutrition is really dialed in. I just try and eat vegetables every meal and have protein every meal because the protein is what gives you the amino acids which are the building blocks for neurotransmitters. And then what a lot of people miss out on, I was just talking to someone last night, you know, they stop eating all the healthy fats. Like, we have this, you know, the low-fat kind of thing still in our heads where we think if we eat something that's high in fat, it's going to be bad for us, where in fact, you know, I forget the exact percentage, but the brain is mostly composed of fatty acids. So I really get in, you know, coconut oil, olive oil, fish oil, avocados, those sorts of things in my diet. Mm -hmm. So nutrition, I just, I'm very strict with my nutrition. And then as far as sleep, I mean, do you want me to go on everything right now? Or Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, you know, sure. this is really valuable information. And then exercise, we all know we need to exercise. I mean, to actually exercise every day makes a huge difference. It sounds so simple and so crazy, but... If you actually just get up and run in the sun or do something for 30 minutes where you're breathing hard every day, mm -hmm. it's going to release that BDNF, a very potent growth hormone that literally reverses the toxic effect that depression has on the mind. 
And, I mean, even when I say that, I mean, a few weeks ago I was starting to feel not so good, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not exercising every day. So it sounds really simple, you should exercise, but, like, you really should. Next thing was really getting the sleep cycle down. Mm -hmm. So the sleep cycle will sort of fix itself if you're eating right and exercising Mm -hmm. and your stress isn't out of whack. But then on top of that... You know, every night I go to sleep, it's in a cool room, I wear an ear mask, and I have earplugs in every single night. Because if I don't sleep for a day or two, then my mood starts to go down. So sleep is like this gold that I have to (laughs) protect. Is there an optimal time to go to sleep? I'm not the right person to ask that. I've read research that says it's best to go to sleep around 10 p.m. because after 11 p.m., your body releases a little cortisol, like to give yourself a second wind. But I'm not 100% sure if there is a right time to go to sleep. But what I can say is it's best to go to sleep at the same time every day. I see. Once you get in that rhythm of going to bed at the same time every day, then you're going to be go to bed and fall asleep rather than oh, I have to wake up early tomorrow and I've been staying up till 3 a.m. every day and then you're going to be laying in bed hating yourself trying to go to sleep. I think I'm a little challenged with the regular sleep thing. <laughs> I do try to get to bed around 11, but sometimes I feel like I do get that second wind around midnight and then I, I'm like lying in bed and I can't sleep until yeah. 1 or 2. That totally sucks. Get podcast ideas, business ideas. I right? know, I know. Some of my most productive times were always around midnight. But I didn't realize that was what was happening, the extra rush of cortisol. All right, so I'd love to ask you, let's say as entrepreneurs, it's tricky, this whole mood thing, because, you know, we have to self-generate everything that we do. So at the same time, sometimes life happens, life gets in the way. So we could be in the throes of like really, you know, taking our business to the next level and then something tragic happens. You know, you could experience a death in the family or Mm -hmm. divorce or, you know, a tragic breakup or, you know, who knows, anything that can happen. And all of a sudden, you know, a life event like that could put you into a tailspin and, you know, take you into a deep pit of uh, depression. So if an entrepreneur was facing a really challenging life event, what advice would you have for them so that they can pull themselves out of that funk quickly? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, depression, I think the worst thing about depression is that it really saps your vitality. It really saps your creativity, your productivity, so that you can go through the motions of doing what you do. And that can kind of work if you're, you know, an employee and, you know, the your employer is taking on the cost of your decreased productivity for however long it lasts. But if you're working for yourself, that's just deadly. Yeah. So when I was selling cars, I had a few moments where I actually got depressed and I had to get myself out really quickly. Now, other than obviously the nutrition exercise and sleep should all be dialed in. Other than that, there's a few little hacks you can do. For one, like if I didn't sleep for a few days, L-tryptophan for sleep as helps like tons of people there's actually someone an entrepreneur that we know and he was reading my site and he was taking xanax every night and i told him about l-tryptophan and he took started taking l-tryptophan at night so what is xanax is that like a a antidepressant Uh, xanax is anti-anxiety medication okay i believe it mainly affects the gaba receptors but he was taking it every night for sleep and, you know, he's one of the big things was he's having to run these, I think it was PPC campaigns, and his sleep cycle was messing him up so much. And I, L-tryptophan, so how your brain actually makes melatonin is it takes the leftover serotonin in your brain, and it'll convert that into HIAA or melatonin. So you actually need extra serotonin to produce melatonin in sleep. It's the reason why a lot of the times with antidepressants, people don't sleep as well. And why if you're depressed and you're tired, you still can't sleep. So how your brain actually makes serotonin is it takes L-tryptophan, converts that into 5-HTP, and then converts that into 5-HT, which is serotonin. It uses B vitamins to do that. So you can take either L-tryptophan or 5-HTP at night, 
and the serotonin production will go into melatonin and make you sleep. So as some people, 5-HTP works better. Some people l tryptophan, but if you're in a funk and it feels like low serotonin, I would definitely try 5-HTP or l tryptophan. You can take them in the day for serotonin or at night because for most people, if they're going to be in a funk, they're not going to be sleeping. And once they start sleeping right, it'll get them out of the funk. Now, if you have the low energy, like everything's numb and just can't get out of bed, but you're not having these obsessive or suicidal, maybe not suicidal, but the low self-esteem thoughts, there's, you know, your norepinephrine and dopamine is low. And that, those are produced by the adrenal glands. So amino acids that support the adrenals and that can reproduce those neurotransmitters is L-tyrosine, which for most people, if they take L-tyrosine in the morning, right when they wake up on an empty stomach, it'll give them more energy than even coffee. Ooh, I gotta try that. (laughs) (laughs) I think some people take it before working out too. So that would be the first thing to try. Tyrosine for me doesn't work because it's actually a little strong and I get agitated and it makes me a little crazy, like almost too much. So there's another supplement not very many people know about. It's L-phenylalanine, and they can try that as well. L-phenylalanine is converted into tyrosine and then into the catecholamines. So there's 5-HTP, L-tryptophan, tyrosine, and L-phenylalanine that they can try to bring them out of the funk. And that's what I was using to rebuild myself to get out of my depression. And when I started to slip... I would just have them there, and I'd be like, okay, take some L-tryptophan tonight and some L-phenylalanine in the morning, and I'd usually be reset in a few days. Whereas, and in the beginning of overcoming my depression, I used those supplements. I was taking actually quite a bit of them in the beginning when I was severely depressed because what it does is it's the natural building blocks in your brain, so it's restoring the natural levels. So once you get to a certain point, you don't need them anymore, which is the good thing. You're not, if you take these things, you're not going to have to take them for the rest of your life because you're dependent on them. Because after a while, you'll take L-tryptophan in a day and you'll get sleepy, or you'll take L-tyrosine in the day and you'll get a little agitated, and that's when you know you've had too much. So I just keep them around now. I actually don't take them anymore, but if I start to slip, I can take those and it's going to rebuild the neurotransmitters in my brain so I can get back quickly versus having to be depressed for a few months because I just had a relapse. Yeah, I think another really good way to address the mood optimization from a nutritional standpoint is to get a blood panel test. So to get a blood test to see, you know, what vitamins and minerals and amino acids too that you might be deficient in. I can't remember what the different tests are. I remember when I went into my naturopath, I took a blood test. I did also a test for neurotransmitters. Yeah, it was a while back. I can't remember. But after, you know, doing that whole, you know, comprehensive diagnostic, she was able to tell me what nutrients I was deficient in and then recommend supplements. And literally, the day I took those supplements, I felt instantaneously better, like it was as if a the sun came out from behind the clouds. Wow. Granted, if you go in and take these tests, chances are it'll take you about a week or so to get the results back. So I would say your quick fix is probably good in the interim and then you know get your butt to a naturopathic doctor oh. and you know do something because every person's body is different. So yeah. you know you're not going to know unless you actually do these tests and figure out you know what your specific system needs in order to be at its optimal levels. Yeah, there's questionnaires and stuff to try and figure it out yourself. And I spent probably half a year to a year experimenting. If I was to do it all again, I would just take the tests. Yeah, I'm yeah there exactly. Like, nah. It's worth it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe these tests might cost you, you know, I don't know, a few hundred dollars if your insurance doesn't cover it. But I would say that the peace of mind gained and the amount of energy you'll recuperate is far worth that. Even at the worst case scenario, you're going to know more about yourself by taking these tests. You're exactly. See, okay, everything's in line. So if these tests are showing everything's perfect, then i got to go another avenue. So you can't ever lose with taking a test. And I'm kind of talking to myself now because I wish I would have taken the test at the beginning. It uh-huh. would just shortcut the whole process. Yeah, because I think one of the dangers, too, is, I mean... 
If you're trying to deal with this issue from a more naturopathic standpoint, I think that's a much better first step than going to a more traditional allopathic doctor who's going to prescribe you antidepressants. And let me tell you, I know people that have been on antidepressants for years and they're just so desperate to get off of them, but they can't. And the risk of some of these antidepressants is that over the years, it can totally make you flip out. Like this one person I know who is a well respected psychologist, you know, very well paid, you know, but has been on, you know, mood enhancing pharmaceutical drugs, you know, I mean, I guess she's you know, eating her own dog food, so to speak. But then she, even she had like a total psychotic episode. And you'd think that, okay, the last person that would go through something like this would be a, a psychologist. But it's, oh, yeah, I it, can go on about antidepressants forever. But the main thing when with you when you're talking about people going crazy, is because what the antidepressants do is they just make the existing serotonin more active. So you know how I was telling you about the leftover serotonin is converted into melatonin, but also that HIAA. So with antidepressants, what they're finding is since there isn't that actual more serotonin in the brain, just more active serotonin, there isn't the leftover serotonin which causes, you know, the sleep problems and everything. But that HIAA is just as vital to emotional well-being as serotonin. So they've even linked some court cases of violent crime to the person having low levels of HIAA. So antidepressants, I don't want to tell anybody that's, you know, suicidal or whatever, don't take them because I don't want to, you know tell someone in that situation not to do it but I mean sometimes they need what they need yeah. you know just to like, get out of that danger zone right yes but the way they just throw antidepressants at people before looking at these other reasons they could be depressed like let's say I have a vitamin B12 deficiency and I'm taking an antidepressant I still have the vitamin B12 deficiency so not only am I taking this strong medication that I don't know how it's going to affect me in the long run I'm still not fixing that core issue because I took antidepressants myself for it was I think six to eight months and getting off of the antidepressant is a whole nother story in itself so antidepressants are a lot more than just you know being handed a pill that's going to make you feel better and before people do that they should consider these other options first before going that route yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit you could just attack right away. Like, okay, cut out sugar and, you know, white starchy food and, you know, do that blood screen and, you know, and, and see and go through some of the most obvious easy steps first rather than get them on the hardcore meds yeah. right away. That could be just a lifelong addiction yes. right there. So let me ask you, was there an aha moment that led you to start your online course and membership site, Dominate Depression? The aha moment was I was sitting there and as I'm thinking about trying to talk to people about depression, it's always that thing like you go to talk to somebody and you say, oh, I'm sad or I'm depressed and all of a sudden people kind of tighten up in this taboo subject. And it's hard if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to produce something of value and you're having these issues and you can't talk to people about it and then you go you search online and you get an eHow article top 10 tips <laughs> to beat seasonal oh winter blues uh -huh. or some you know just some doctor telling you something out of a textbook so I was thinking you know what if I came up with this name dominate depression we're gonna just talk about depression openly We'll talk about how to actually overcome it because I've seen a lot of places they treat the person to just where they're semi-functioning and not what I would call fully recovered. So I had this moment like, okay, people need a place or an outlet where they can see somebody that's been there just talking about it normally and openly because depression is... It took me so long like with the, you know, trying to think, oh, it was something wrong with me. And then all of a sudden I'm like, no, it's not. Something's not wrong with me as a person. It's just this depression thing is happening to me. That it's like, let's just be able to tell people, look, you feel a little depressed. This is what you need to do to get helped. 
thinking it's all about me or my moral stuff. I don't know if I'm going off topic right now. No, I mean, I think it's such a head trip. Yeah. You can't talk about it. You know, it's easy to, you know, think that there's something wrong with you, that you're not grateful enough, you're too selfish or self-absorbed, or and you had a bad childhood. There's so many different ways in which you can think about the reason why you don't feel good about yourself is that there's something wrong with you. There's myriad things that are wrong with you, which is resulting in you not feeling good, but that's not solving the problem, right? It's not solving the problem. And then I think another important thing that, you know, we haven't really acknowledged as a society is how common it is. I actually think that depression is the norm, Mm -hmm. And especially in our Western society, for a number of different cultural and, you know, social reasons. I mean, I think people are less likely to admit it. I think people accept that they're somewhat, you know, mediocre or, you know, like they're living lives where they're not truly thriving. They're living lives, you know, that they're not like deeply happy and fulfilled by but then you know it's easy to rationalize and say oh you know i have things i have it good and there's nothing for me to complain about so i'm just going to you know go on you know and yep. but the truth is that the feeling of just deep inner joy is not there yeah and it is a little insane how no one talks about it and i was even reminded more of that when i started the site cuz i started getting emails from people just like secretly saying hey I've been depressed, you know, like all these people just coming out. And it is frustrating because you have all this stuff and then people say, you should be grateful for what you have, but the person's going crazy because they don't feel grateful and they're like, well, why don't I feel grateful? There's something wrong with me. But it's just because they're depressed. They're in that state of mind where they can't experience the pleasure of the things they have. Yeah, and you have your friends and family. They're probably, you know, saying things. And they mean well when they say these things. Like, oh, you'll just get out of it. Oh, you know, chin up. You know, just keep persevering or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't make the yucky feelings go away. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, how do you work with people? How do you make money through your membership site? And, you know, like what services do you offer? So I have a six-week course. It's for people that are in depression and they really need the fundamentals in place. And basically what I do is I take those individual aspects, the supplements, the nutrition, the exercise, the stress reduction, mastering your sleep and getting support. I split it up into different weeks so that people get just only a week of content at a time so they can really focus and make the changes that's going to keep them depression free. And then just recently, some people told me I should start coaching, so I haven't actually... I've only coached one person as of last night, but I am also going to get into, you know, really working with people one-on-one because that's what I used to do when I worked for a nonprofit. I was a mentor, worked one-on-one. I really liked that. The course is cool, and but I want to combine both the course and the coaching. So the course for people that are like, you know, I can make these changes. I just need some guidance. And then the coaching for, let's say, someone that needs a little more than that or they're going through all that crazy stuff and they need someone they can say, this is what's going on, what should I do, and express themselves. How long did it take for you to put together this course? This it Was it an eight-week course? A six-week six week, six week yeah. course. Yeah, how much work is that? So <laughs> I was sitting around like kind of making it for I don't know how long. And then someone just pressured me and said, TJ, you need to get this done. And so we made a deal where I had to finish it in 30 days or I had to give him 500 bucks. So what I know is that part took me 30 days. But I've been, (laughs) I was sitting there like trying (laughs) trying to put what I have learned through all the books and schooling and experience into one place. And then finally, that's what got me to do it. So it was 30 days of getting the videos done, the transcripts, the worksheets, and the editing, and then learning the membership software probably took like a week and a half. Of... What membership software do you use? Wishlist. Okay, yeah, it's a WordPress plugin. Cool. So how do people discover your website? Where do your customers come from? So a lot come just from someone telling somebody else to message me to email me. So it was a word of mouth referrals? Um, Right now I'm getting a little traffic from Google and I'm trying to learn Facebook advertising so I can 
target individuals more effectively because Google is going to be kind of a struggle with especially PPC ads because pharmaceutical companies are all over that. So the bid price is through the roof. Yeah, I can imagine. So yeah, totally. How it's much like per six or seven bucks per click? Oh, yeah, totally. I'm in the process of trying to figure out what's the best way to find those people that need help and bring them to my site. As of right now, it's just been from organic search and people saying, hey, you should talk to TJ. Perfect. Wow, that's pretty good. What's well, a good place, you know, to be in where you're getting referrals and, you know, you've got like a pipeline of leads coming through, you know, really having to do much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> having to spend <laughs> advertising budget to get those leads, you know. But, yeah, you could certainly open up the floodgates some more if you – with a Facebook campaign for sure. Let's see. So in your entrepreneurial journey – was there any mistake that you made that you'd do differently if you had the chance to do it all over again? If I was to do it all over again, before I made the course, I would have done some paid advertising and really figured out more exactly what people wanted. Right now, you know, there's some people that's gone through the course. They tell me it's really good, their depression's relieved, and those sorts of things. But I'm still kind of in the dark because I really want to give people exactly what they need. And my course, as good as it is, I wish I would have really kind of got from people more like these are some specific issues I need handled so I could really hone in and give people the content that they want, that they're telling me they want. Like the people that are in my course are loving it, but if I was to do it again, I would have, before I recorded all the videos, I would have put the course up see if people bought it first and then made the course rather than making the course and then seeing if people would buy it. I would have reversed that process. You know, that's interesting because I've been exploring that chicken or egg scenario myself. So I think it kind of depends a lot on whether you have a list to begin with. Another podcast guest that I spoke to, AJ Silvers of Conversions IO. I was asking him, the big internet marketing gurus talk about the importance of pre-selling your product before you actually commit to creating it first, but how do you do this if you don't have a list? He's like, yeah, if you have a list, you have people you can pre-sell the product to, but if you don't have a list at all, then you might as well go ahead and create a product and drive traffic through it, buy the traffic, and then see what your buyers actually think of your product and then improve it from there. Yeah, that's what I did. You know, it's a learning process. There's so many ways to skin an internet marketing cat. So let me ask you this. Is this business your life purpose? And if not, what is? Yes, this is my life purpose. With my personal experience in 11 years just of depression and the experiences I had, it'd be... You know, it just feels like that's what I need to do is give back what I've learned and what I've been through to people because I know what they're experiencing. And when I was experiencing it, it felt like no one knew. I felt like I couldn't go to anybody and get help. So, yeah, this is definitely a life purpose. So was there a process that you went through where you were like, aha, my life purpose is to help people overcome depression? Or did it just click one day because this was your experience and you suddenly realized that you had successfully overcome depression and the best way you could give back was to help other people do the same? I vividly remember a few depressive episodes during them and after just thinking, you know, I don't want anyone else to have to feel that way. But I never like had this singular moment where I was like, yeah, this is what I should do. I've kind of dabbled in and out of it. And then when I was selling cars, I was thinking, how can I maybe have more meaningful thing, a way to make money? And that's when I was like, okay, you've had all these experiences. Let's buy the one-way ticket to Thailand. Let's go. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that initiative. So we're at the end of our segment. How can we best stay in touch with you, TJ? Uh, you can email me, tj at dominatedepression.com or taylorjamestj at gmail.com. That's the best way. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us and sharing with us your tips on how to get out of depression quickly. Thank you. Thanks, folks, for listening to the Entrepreneurs for Change podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more people with inspiring stories like this one by giving us a five-star rating in iTunes. 
If this podcast inspires you to join the movement of change-making entrepreneurs, we'd love to give you a jumpstart with our free Business Changemakers Toolkit, which you can download at www.entrepreneursforachange.com slash join. If you have a changemaker in mind you'd love for us to interview, go to entrepreneursforachange.com slash suggest and tell us who and why. Finally, feel free to stop by facebook.com slash entrepreneurs for a change to share your thoughts and say hello. 